Okay, uh, I think we'll make a start. So good morning and welcome to this third and final webinar in the GLA Whole Life Carbon Benchmarking and Performance uh, Requirements Series. Um, I'm joined today by an expert panel, uh, some of the authors of the GLA guidance, Chan Lee, Sarah Linnell and Simon Sturges who will take you through today the targets uh, and potentially benchmarks and potentially targets for the new GLA requirements. Uh, if you'd like to catch up, there are two more sessions going through the requirements uh, and understanding the, the, the nuances to the GLA requirements. This is now in force and all major referable schemes have to report their whole life carbon as part of their planning applications. Uh, and over time, it's expected to get more stringent and uh, Chan and Sarah will take you through some of the key points. If you have any questions today, please do write them in the chat uh, function. We're trying to leave a significant period of time at the end to go through questions and have a bit of a debate about some of the challenges we see coming in the sector. Okay, without further ado, I'll hand over to Sarah to recap on the last two sessions. Great, thanks, Simon. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, as Simon said, this is the last of um, a three part series that we've done on um, the GLA's whole life carbon assessments guidance. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of the previous two webinars to bring everyone up to speed. Uh, but obviously, you can catch up with all of these on our website. So Obviously, we're talking about whole life carbon emissions, and that is made up of embodied carbon and operational carbon. Um, you can see by this graphic that the operational carbon contribution is mainly coming from energy, from heating the building, lighting the building, etc. And um, that dark blue color almost is reducing over time uh, due to efficiencies in the electricity grid and other efficiencies in technology and equipment. Um, so what that means really for us um, as building designers, as people working in this industry, is that there is an increased need for a focus on embodied carbons, so the carbon that's coming within the materials. So in terms of uh, guidances around embodied carbon. Um, there are various that have been released over the last 10 years and um, even prior to that. Uh, but what we're really focusing on and what we have been focusing on in this series is the GLAs, so the Greater London Authority's Whole Life Cycle Carbon Assessments Guidance. Um, initially, the consultation draft was released in October 2020, and then the final version was released in March this year. So I suppose, given we've seen there are all of these guidances out there, the question is, well, why, why do we need more guidance? Well, um, this is specific guidance in response to the London plan. Um, so this policy here states that development proposals which are referable to the mayor should calculate whole life carbon emissions through the whole life carbon assessment um, recognised scheme and demonstrate actions to reduce said emissions. Um, now, if we break this up again, uh, Simon mentioned that it's compulsory for referable. So referable for anyone who doesn't know um, is defined as 150 residential units or more uh, or over 30 metres in height or um, on the green belt um, area of uh, London. And when we're talking about nationally recognised assessment procedure, um, this is where the guidance really breaks this up and, and defines this more for us. Um, and then finally, when, when it mentions demonstrating actions to reduce, um, that's using whole life carbon reduction principles. Um, so mainly in the previous two webinars, what we've done is um, broken down this statement and um, tried to explain in more detail what the principles for minimizing emissions associated with embodied carbon are. Um, and in webinar one, Simon Sturgis went into quite a bit of detail on that. So I would definitely advise watching that back. Um, but additionally, in, in webinar one, we, we looked at the actual uh, life cycle assessment process and trying to understand that um, with the lens of the GLA. Um, so mainly that is gathering the data, processing that, using LCA software, interpreting that data um, and applying reductions. And that also feeds into the next design stage. Um, and so in webinar two, we went into more detail of that, trying to understand what does that mean when it comes to submitting 
for planning um, for the GLA. And really there are these three main steps. Um, there is a um, pre-application step, there is a um, outline and detailed application step, and then there's a post-completion step. So as you can see in this flow chart, at pre-application you are um, just before stage two perhaps, and you are making early design decisions. Um, and so you will submit data to the GLA to show that, show your intent um, when the design is developed a little bit further, so stage REBA stage three, perhaps, um, then you will be doing a detailed assessment and showing your reduction options. Um, and then finally, once, once the um, construction is complete, um, then it will be running the assessment again and almost showing where um, reductions have been then implemented, how this then compares to your previous values. And these numbers are then compared against benchmarks. So that is then the focus of this webinar today. Um, and Chan will go into much greater detail about benchmarks and, and why they're important, where they came from. Um, but hopefully this has been a useful series for you. Um, but yeah, we look forward to answering the questions. OK, over to you, Chan. OK, thank you, Zara. And as Sarah mentioned, this webinar will be focusing on about benchmarks. And I think one of the key achievements we'll, we'll, we'll manage to do for the GLA's whole carbon policy is to introduce a series of benchmark values for the uh, schemes to be assessed against. And please be, be mindful, this is not target at the moment. It's just a, a reference point for you to aim your assessment against and like a sense check for your application and for your results. And so in the consultation, we published a series of, of, of the values. And during the consultation period, we received more information and more data about the uh, additional data about suitable and feasible benchmark values. So we included additional data sets. We expanded the uh, data points we had. And when, then we verified and checked the, the values and then run a little bit update to the, uh, the benchmark value slightly to make it more aligned with the LATI and RBA's value. So make sure when people are talking about the value, talking about the, the number, they're also in a consistent manner. And also we make sure that scope assessment are consistent and also make sure the, uh, the project are sort of verified and included more representative a range of data. So we're going to break this into down into three mini sections. This is what update we have been made and also what the scopes of the benchmarks are and also how the numbers are to be interpreted and how you should read into those values. We added a, a probably about 40 or 50 more data sets uh, compared to what we had before. And again, you can see from the breakdown, most of them are offices and residential. For schools, we had a, a bit more data from last time. But for retail, we only had 15 uh, data with good quality, good enough quality we can incorporate into, the, into this asset, into the benchmarking uh, exercise. So we removed the data. When we, when we received the data sets from the people sub, who, who kind of submitted data, we had to remove a certain of them because it wasn't clear the scope of assessment or it's impossible to, for them to identify what is included, what is not. So it's just to, to avoid the sort of gap in the, in the scope assessment, we had to remove the data with uncertainty. It's UK building related, UK building only, and with a focus of a big each development uh, and because it's a referable scheme the GLA that means it's normally it's a scheme of a, a certain size or above and the numbers are aligned and not, not perfectly but it's, it's aligned with with the values RBA and LATI are promoting so it's again as I said is to increase the consistency and comparability between the, those benchmarking or the, those, those uh, rating systems you can see the most of the data, data come from uh, Condo, Token Zero, Arup, Hills and Moran, and Price Myers. And Price Myers and Arup provide the building um, data of the building, uh, fab building the structures only. So it didn't include the fittings or finishes or, or MEP, et cetera. And MEP is still based on the uh, standard benchmark values we had from last time. 
but we did run some update based on the uh, building structure values received from those two companies. And as a, one of the uh, achievements we did is in the construction period is we we allow, and then the RBAs updated benchmark values and let it update benchmark values. They all talking about the um, using the same number range and trying to match the uh, similar scope of assessment to again as I said to ensure consistency. So basically, if you run the calculation based on GLA, it's be very close to the result or almost identical result, you will want to report against RBA standard. And there's a slight difference between uh, those two and LAT here, which we'll explain later. And as I said, there's the scope of the benchmarks. It is, again, we ask people to report module A1 to A5, B1 to B5, and C1 to C4. Although B6 and B7 is not calculated based on this policy, you, you need to report it based on your BSIN result in your planning application anyway. But in, in this, we focus on materials, which is basically those modules we mentioned earlier. And this is based on the RCS professional statement and what will be included at minimum. And also we have in, um, provided a list of MEP element you need to consider for with a minimum. Because when we start, when we produce a initial uh, documentation, the TM65 was not um, available. And, but again, during the construction period, TM65 become available and we made reference to this document and created a list of MEP items we need to include that normally with a, a high carbon impact. Um, if you didn't choose you need to use EPD or in accordance with the uh, BSEN 15804, this is preferred data. Again, in the document, in the um, policy, we also listed there are any other sources should you struggle to find the appropriate data in the EPD and there's other, other source of materials and data you could use and consider in your calculation. And the benchmark buildings are it's a business average of lots of designs and most of them are from using standard construction method. Basically it's a concrete structure or steel structure. I think maybe like one or two buildings in the, in the whole benchmark are using a sort of timber construction or sort of more efficient construction. So on average, we think it's a representative of a sort of standard practice business or business as, as Euro and construction method. Um, again, we covered four most typical typologies and residential, office, education, and retail. The reason we only had this four is that, that that's where we have the most amount of data. And we are trying to collect more data through this uh, process. And again, if we have more, more and more data, more valid data, there's I think it's possible to add in more benchmarks to this in the future updates. And if it's your application is a mixed use design or mixed use development, you choose you select topology that makes up the greatest proportion. Say if you have a residential building with retail on the ground floor or office building with ground floor retail. So you choose a, um, the office benchmark because again, the most structures and the infrastructure are serving the, the majority of the building, which is the uh, office function. Again, if your building is not covered, for example, if you're doing a big lab or, or, or life science building, I would suggest, I mean, choose the nearest one, but again, in, in this case, you choose to choose the highest benchmark value to just to, to see if that more representative. And again, it's, it's for benchmarks, it's impossible to cover the, for every single module or, or every single type of application based on data we have. So you, we have to, uh, really just you have to choose the most appropriate one you, you, you think the representative of your design and then maybe state a reason why you choose that um, particular benchmark value and in terms of refurbishment again we we have some data for refurbishment schemes but it's impossible to draw a benchmark because this is hugely dependent on a scope of refurbishment you can either do a a, a wired light internal uplift or you have to a major refurbishment which including demolition and extension. So it's, it's kind of quite tricky to say oh, what is the scope and extent of the refurbishment. But what 
Jai asked you to do in this case is to still choose the uh, new build benchmark, but this way you can identify or demonstrate the benefit of retention of structure or retention of certain building element. But also the, the benchmark did give breakdown of different building components. You can still compare to your component by component. For example, if you do a refurbishment, maybe your structure was much lower, but if you don't do well in the facade and internal furniture, you still maybe show up higher in those categories. Although you may be lower overall, but you can, you can by doing this exercise, you can identify, oh, I might need to do better on my facade, I might do better on my internal finishes to bring them down or in line with the benchmark values. Um, again, the benchmarks are based on Sheldon Core and Cat A. It does not include in Cat B or does not include in any uh, loose furniture. The, the benchmark do include PVs and actual work. This is slightly different from Letty. Uh, Letty's um, bending values are not excluding PVs and actual works, but the reason for Letty not including them is that the part of value for Letty is using its upfront in body carbon. And they worried about using putting PVs uh, body carbon into the Letty bending will start to disencourage people to use a PV because they might have a, get a penalty have, have having too much PV on, on their building. But for the GLA and sort of other um, RBA, et cetera, because their um, scope of measurement is whole life carbon. So the benefit of the PV and the generation from the PVs will be and are covered in the B6 module. So we, we asked for the, for the GLA and for the RBA, you need to include the calculation of the PV and external work of the building into your uh, assessment. Again, for Faletti, just on the side note, you still need to calculate them. It just not, won't be part of your uh, target value. But again, this is slight difference in the GLA and, and others. And we have gone through quite a lot of discussion in terms of how we calculate the carbon sequestration, mean, which means the carbon stored in a building material, if it's organic material, because it's so sort of locks in carbon during its sort of manufacturing or during its, its growth of the, uh, the particular material. And in terms of the reporting, we trying to avoid any sort of a muddy the water situation when the timber was not was used too much, but because they have a negative carbon value, it's actually be a benefit. But it's probably not the best case in terms of material efficiency in some situation. So what we ask people to do is report the carbon section separately. For example, in the table here, you have a say, timber building and you have a GLA benchmark value of office. Just for, for, for argument's sake, if you do not consider the carbon sequestration of the timber, the upfront in body carbon is, a, is the same or similar to a, a GLA benchmark. However, if it's still building or concrete building, at the end of life, you demolish the building, it doesn't really matter if you call how much recycling, how much uh, sort of demolition you do, it means still the, the, the impact really is smaller compared to a say, timber frame building because you, if you incinerate timber for energy or you put it in landfill or, or vice versa, you, you spend more energy or release more energy or, or carbon for the um, end of life of the, uh, the timber element. So in this case, if you're not including sequestration, the, the end of life uh, emission might even be higher compared to standard building. But if you include, when that's why we, in, when we calculate the whole life carbon of the, the building, you need to include the sequestration when you do the uh, whole life scenario. So you can add in the carbon sequestered and as well as the, timber might, uh, the carbon might be released at the end of its life. So you, 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 can, you form a whole picture. So you see the whole life cycle on the whole life cycle scenario, it's still a lower carbon building because again, the timber, there's timber sequestration benefit. But again, if you use timber from a non-FSA source, say that the timber will not be replaced and then you lose a sequestration benefit, you end up having a probably worse building than worse than standard practice building because again, the, the, you don't have the benefit of carbon sequestration. Um, 
another question we've been asked um, recently uh, and is, as I mentioned, most of the buildings are based on big sort of larger scale development. They say, should we have a smaller benchmarks for smaller buildings or will smaller buildings automatically have a much more footprint, carbon footprint? It's not necessarily the case. I mean, in some instance, for example, if I do a very small house, you might have a much smaller foundation, but again, you might lose some um, surface volume ratio benefit compared to large scale. So you, you may have a smaller carbon, smaller footprint of the building, but because all the material will have a, on average on the meter square rate basis, you'll have a much bigger impact of the material. So if you have a major uh, plant, major equipment or something, then you, you may have a bigger, much bigger impact uh, on of that and make the carbon footprint higher. This is uh, five industrial projects where you may we worked we looked at before or we worked on before. You see the GIA are quite different. The area of the those buildings are quite different. You can see this also we summarize the tonnage of concrete and the tonnage of steel and then do the average of tonnage of concrete and tonnage of steel per meter square. You can see the biggest building, because again, they have a surface volume ratio, quite bent, sort of good surface volume ratio, they actually have a quite good um, amount of uh, less concrete per square meter of the GIA. Although on, in, on a total basis, yeah, those buildings have a much, much higher emission, but purely looking at the efficiency perspective, this smaller building or smaller building does not normally give you a, a automatically lower carbon footprint because again, it's just a small footprint on average. Sometimes the, the average or the density will be higher. Um, also, there's uh, because we align the, the values and uh, the part of the thing is RBA align their, their, their targets with, with GLA. And that in, for, for some, some people, if they don't read it sort of carefully or don't read it fully, they, 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 they see a thing. It's actually a, a relaxation of the number because number on paper is, is higher, but actually it, it is not a, 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 a man, it's, it's not relaxation at all. It just is amendment and alignment. Also by defining the um, the scope of assessment and also by defining the template of the uh, report it requires a, a more completed, uh, more actually it's more challenging scope of reporting because you need to report everything more properly and more fully and ask you to report at least 95% of the cost of the, uh, by cost, at least all the material covered in the each building category. So again, if you actually monitor or report everything more properly and uh, more inclusively, sometimes or most times your, your number will go high. And I think that to, in some, to some extent, the number is only a representative number we we'll need to be, be more um, concerned about, more, more careful about it, is the scope of measurement and the how complete is your assessment. So this, for example, this is the um, Letty template and also the, on the, on the, with the uh, green shaded and ex, sort of Excel template, this is what we developed for GLA on the um, reporting of their carbon value. So this breaks down into different category, different modules. So this way people can see quite clearly if something is obviously missed, if it's a big empty zero or something was super low in this category and vice versa. So it's, it's give less of opportunity to of missing certain things. And also this improve the transparency and comparability. So if you look at your near value, you can still have a very low carbon building. Then when you compare this with other assessment or other benchmark and you realize what, well, this value is very low and uh, there's no very good reason. There must be, there might be a reason because you, you not from a design, maybe you miss a certain assessment or certain things was not included, which should be. So again, that, that will make this, your, your asset more complete and in a, in a way it will make your number or carbon number go higher. This is the um, serial project we worked on in the last couple of years, you see, Majority of them are on average is still about 1,500 in terms of whole life in body carbon. And the, that's why the benchmark for this is for office and for benchmark, 
at the moment is really 1,400. Again, we don't know yet, but the, in, in the next couple of years, when GLA get more data, they might update their, their target value. Maybe on, on the next 2025, they might, might bring it down. In 2030, they might bring it even further. So it's like on, at the moment, although people say, oh, we want to challenge, we want a more challenging target. From what we've seen, probably less than 10% of the new build high spec development can meet this sort of a very challenging LATI 2020 and also RPA benchmark values, unless it's a refurbishment. But on a positive note, we do see, start to see buildings have a lower um, carbon compared to, the, this is the set of data we gathered from 2015, 2020, maybe a few 2021 sort of each design projects. You see that this, those are the ones we can see with people putting more effort and more um, focus on the material specification and from design to minimize the material usage, we are seeing a reduction of carbon values, probably like a, maybe 50 to 100 kg CO2 square per square meter year by year reduction, just generally, because again, people are making better use of their materials. But still, to, to, to jump from here to, to the uh, more challenging target, it's like a 40% reduction, it will do require some more uh, work and more participation from this, within the design team. And also, you can see from building structures, et cetera, we are seeing reductions. But in some areas, we're actually seeing increase, for example, with the TM65 being implemented, there's more transparency and more data available now in the building services. But what that is, is, is making is, you can see, this is for typical office building, you're looking at about 125, or I mean, something like 130 kilogram CO2 per square meter of your uh, building from MEP. And this, at the moment, probably is a less scope to reduce compared to other because there's a limited availability of sort of low, lower carbon, lowering body carbon building, building service equipment. And also, with the people, when people using TM65 method more and more, Again, as I said, because they, they realize or oh, they miss certain things in their calculation, the number may even be higher. So it is not always automatically being reduced and with more precise requirement and with more precise uh, monitoring and reporting methodology being available, the number might just go even go higher. Yeah, this is um, what we mentioned. This is what we predict the trajectory of the target might be. But again, in certain areas, it does not mean since we'll go down automatically, you need to work really hard to make sure you capture the big ticket items early on the design stage and maybe try to re retain certain structure element if you if you have this opportunity. And also in terms of building some other building elements to report them as, as precisely as possible to and then we can identify the area that need further investigation to minimize the carbon footprint. And also people say, oh, will the grid, will the grid get better and better? Will the carbon factors automatically get lower? It's like the, my, my last point on the TM65, because the methodology are being more and more mature, people are calculating this in, in a better way. So this is example from the IC database, which is the inventory of carbon energy. This is the, one of the best sources of free available sources in the UK of material carbon data. So the version two was published in 2011, I think. And version three was published and um, nine years after that. So it was updated. And they also used the same quantity of materials, which apply for build, uh, for, for house, to, for different houses or, or different for office or university, et cetera. For the same assessment, just applying the different fa carbon factors in the version two and version three, you can see actually the, the carbon is going up for all the in all the cases. This is not because the grid get worse because the, in the UK it's actually the grid get better. It's because when they getting better of monitoring the carbon data of their materials, they start to realize things have gone uh, gone wrong or things things haven't they have not included properly. So they start to once they do this, the carbon factor go up. Hence the, the overall carbon value of the buildings go going up as well. So as I said, 
the benchmarks are are there for you to reference and 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 it's not a target yet then they might might become a target a couple of years down the line but now is a value for you to like a sense check and also to see how far you how how how, how much reduction you already you already have or how much reduction you need to achieve to meet the target or bypass the target and also there's some um to break down of the different parts of the bill this is although it's quite a generic for offices is a for them we have a breakdown of different building elements building parts it's just for you to compare against if you have different proportion it's certain if you do a refurbishment you can compare the building element to element but again all the building all the design are slightly different to each other the proportion here for a, like a reference point only it's just for the again uh, in the document says a sense check uh, for people to explain the differences and to identify areas that could they could focus on more and also it is a way for people to for commitment of reduction and to also from this process by comparing the benchmark and by submitting your data what you are hoping to do to gain is also to have a more consolidated carbon database based on the submitted data for them to draw a updated benchmark values for the future updates. Okay, so that's uh, bring us to the end of my uh, pres our presentation. I think it's now it's time for some questions. Yes, thank you, Chan. So as I said, if you've got any questions, please do put them in the questions and answer box. A um, few are starting to come through. One of the interesting things, Chan, that you've just gone through is obviously the GLA are starting to collect data on this and you showed the, the data sheet which uh, breaks it down by the elements. When, when they collect that data, will that be freely available going forward so that you can compare projects or, do you, or is that unknown at the moment? It's unknown, but the data will be is publicly available, will be on the planning portal. The there's a plan to host it into the uh, there's a there's a website and um, RCS is hosting, will be hosting, and there's discussions for this be transposed onto that website so people can filter and, and compare. But there's some sensitive data data in, in terms of the, the, the projects in is that that's the, that's the BECD buildings yeah. uh, environmental carbon database. So that will be that's evolving relatively quickly now. I think so that will be running in the next few months. All projects will eventually go onto that. Those submitted to the GLA. I think, yeah, I mean that that's the the plan, and also that database is free available for everybody. And if you're doing the RCS calculations, you can upload your result. Basically, that's replacing the RAV database. And hopefully that will become a, a consolidated for the, for the UK-based data portal. Okay. Uh, one of the interesting things you mentioned is obviously MEP has been lagging behind for a number of years and now starting to actually calculate embodied carbon using TM65, which is generally given higher results. Is there a requirement in the GLA um, guidance that you have to use TM65 or can you still use things like the average benchmark factors in Stroma? I think the, they ask you to use TMC somewhere as possible. And if you do early stage, don't have the data at all, I think benchmark values is can be used and can only be used. Um, they did make a, a reference on, on a list of the equipment you have to include. And they did make a reference to TM65. I think that try to use TM65 where, where it's possible because the old database may give you a forced low result and then it's difficult for you when you do the post completion update to match that number if your benchmark was too low or too optimistic. Okay. And just talking about early stage design, there's a question here. In the Rick's whole life carbon guidance, how do you calculate the embodied carbon via the adjustment method using cost when there is no design? <clears throat> um, I would say that, you, well, I would assume that if you've got a cost plan, you must have some sort of design. But I think you, the answer to your question will probably be better answered in a few months' time because um, at the, what, what is, is happening is that the, um, the next version of the RICS professional statement will interlink with ICMS3, which is the International Cost Measurement Standard. So they will, that they will uh, work in tandem with each other, which I think will make things much easier from that perspective. 
Okay, that's really interesting. I'll be looking forward to that coming out. There's another question coming in uh, about the general emissions factors uh, and the ICE database. Uh, they just want clarification what it includes. So it obviously covers A1 to A3, but is there data for B1 to B5, C1 to C4, and A4 and A5? What, what's included and what isn't? The Normally the EPDs or database include A1 to A3, and A4, A5 is sort of site dependent. In the in the policy, either RSS document and GLA policy, they did tell you what number to use when you calculate the uh, A5. And also there is a standard waste rate you can use based on the rep methodology. Um, for B module and B1 to B3, there are some benchmark values you could use for the in the GLA documentation. We gave some indicative numbers people to, to apl can apply to. And for B4 and B5, that dependent on the lifespan. But again, RCS methodology and GLA documentation have got those benchmark values. So it's it's all there, but it's it's if you need to sort of go through the, the, the documents to identify the the appropriate and um, in appropriate sections, you can, you can identify the, the the values or the benchmark you should use in the early especially in the early design stage when you don't have that much data. And Regarding the GLA guidance and um, generally just whole life carbon assessments, when should you be substituting benchmark data for A1 to A3 and then also similar question for A4? So if you should you if you know roughly where you're going to get supplies for, should you still be using benchmark data or should you be using real data but that will lock in your supply chain? Is there a tipping point? I would think you want to use um, real data as soon as you've got it. Um, uh, and indeed, if you're at, even if you're at early design stages, say RIBA stage three, uh, or even earlier, but certainly with stage three, you want to start using um, the best or closest information to what you expect the ultimate design to be like. Um, otherwise, you're 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 you know you you're you're not giving yourself a, a a a proper indication. And some of this, of course, information might be location dependent. So, you know, that will obviously be important to factor all that in. Given the current climate and uh, difficult to uh, secure uh, materials and supplies and the cost of inflation, is there a risk that you're making an additional cost doing that? Or should you be leaving safety margins if, you, if instead of going single source of supplies? Um, I think like with any design process, I think you've got to be mindful of, of you know contingencies and also and risk. I think one of the other things about the RICS upgrade will be that we'll be bringing in an element of risk management within that in the same way that there is financial risk management in a cost plan approach. Um, Chen, I think you- So okay. yeah, I think it's in terms of this is probably two, two, two um, point to this as one is, well, I think I agree that to leave some, to make this financially stand up or just minimum financial risk, I would suggest and always have a plan B through this material not be available and um, try to, I think I always in, in the early stage, I'll try to always start with the baseline benchmark and can see where you improvement could, could take you to. And, but if certain materials is the key for, or is the make or fail of your building, say if you're a concrete building, the reason you choose a concrete building, concrete frame over any, anything else is a high semi replacement in your structural systems. And in this case, because that's how you base on your design assumptions, you must ensure that's happening otherwise if you say okay i'm um, my assumption or my design is based on 70 percent ggbs but when it comes to procurement they say oh that's not not available anymore then that that means all the assumption you have in design state does it's not valid anymore your building may actually be worse than than other options you discounted so if your design is based on that particular material be available you need to make sure your design it, it, and your cost can accommodate that. You may have two people, three people that could supply you this particular material. The thing in this case, if certain things are the reason you're choosing certain design parameter, that need to be very, very specific. And that would be precise, as precise as possible, as early as possible. Then you can't keep relying on benchmark values. So I think there's a, it's, it's maybe I would say in the detailed design stage, that's where you can start to, to substitute so benchmark values with more precise data. And we can start 
making some commitment or start locking certain materials in your design because they are fundamental factors for the, the carbon footprint. If I could also just add something, I think um, experience working with uh, uh, Kundal and, and, and uh, on, on this exact sort of problem, I think it's pretty clear that there are always significant number of um, carbon efficient products that can be got from the supply chain without adding costs. So I suppose in looking at from both uh, residential and office schemes, uh, we've done analyses and, 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 and so on, which has shown that as much as sort of 20 to 30% carbon reductions can be achieved from a sort of a fairly high carbon base, if you like, without, uh, by being familiar and understanding the supply chain without adding costs. So there's cost neutral options out there. Um, you just need to know where to look. Thanks. Uh, question regarding, Chan, you showed the trajectory of where we potentially could go. Is there any plan by the GLA to actually introduce or change the benchmarks into targets? And is there a timescale for uh, ratcheting up those those targets? Is that being discussed? It's been definitely been discussed. It's even been discussed in this uh, in the first draft. And the, the reason there haven't been a task, uh, a, 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 a target or, or regulatory target is they don't have enough data or haven't got certainty of data when they can legislate this. So again, as I said, by doing this process, they are collecting hundreds of data a year. So within the next update, there, uh, I'm, I'm only a matter of time, they've introduced targets and they've were introduced quite stringent targets. So it is now is the time for people to practice the knowledge and to practice the calculation and to identify should the target be being introduced, how fast they can react to this and how easy, how, how, how they, how can they be prepared for this? It's, I think it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when and, and how, basically. It, it's a, I'm pretty sure in the next version or so, there will be a, 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 a update to the values and update to the requirement. And both you and Simon have talked about quick and easy wins uh, regarding uh, reducing upfront and body carbon. Um, in terms of the where we are with the GLA benchmark at the moment compared to the Letty 2030 target, how far do you reckon we can get towards the Letty 2030 target purely by specification and design uh, in terms of reduction? How much, and then how much do you think we need for that to come from the supply chain? So what, what percentage do you think is design? What percentage do you think is supply chain? I'll go to Simon first and I'll go to see, see what Jan has to say on that. Um, I think this is a really interesting question because um, I think as Chen's figures suggested, we're some way off that at the moment. Um, I think it's obviously going to be, a, it's going to be evolutionary. It's going to be a, a combination of, um, of things. I think what we need, of course, is support from government to kind of put some pressure on the trajectory downwards to net zero. Uh, and I think the supply chain will respond, but I think also we need to think very differently. And I think um, we need to, uh, you know, so it's design and supply chain, but I think, um, Clearly, from the design point of view, clients need to get behind that um, and recognize that this is the way forward. This is, you know, this will be where tenants will, will want to be. And um, the nature of buildings and how you specify them and whether you keep more than you anticipated on site, you know, from by way of existing buildings, that kind of thing. I think the mix of, uh, of retention and, and new build will, be, will, will evolve and change to, in, in favor of, of retention. So I think there's a lot of things that are gonna to have to happen, but I think from a client's perspective, I think it is really, it is obviously difficult because you've got to look into the future a bit, but it is really what is going to be attractive to tenants in 10 years time. Uh, is the building you're designing today gonna to be suitable as a low carbon building when we're all driving around in electric cars, which will be the case in 10 years time. Uh, well, it, it may not be literally the case, but you're able to buy, um, an, an, a, a non-electric car, I think, from about 2030. So that's a, a world we're coming into. So how do you plan for that? And I think I agree with Simon's point. And, and I, was, I think in terms of the, the, the who is sort of more responsible to a certain bid, I think I, I would think the designers or the design team will take a lead and then the, we cannot rely purely on the market to make those things available. I mean, from what we've seen, 
they are trying to catch up in terms of the, the supply chain, but it takes a long time. I mean, the, the steel industry, the concrete industry, they're talking about decarbonizing themselves, but they trying to make it before 2030, it's purely be from the supply chain is is very difficult and very impossible. And the, the design need to designers need to incorporate the more efficient design and try to minimize the material first or using better material for before we can see rely on the supply chain to supply low carbon materials of the already simplified design already you know, sort of a optimized design. So I, would, I would think maybe 70% still lies with the design team and maybe 30% or less uh, can be relied on. But again, when the market is, is fully updated, then we can rely more on, on, on supply chain. But probably one thing we sort of maybe one last point which what we shouldn't forget is even we have a zero carbon economy and supply chain and manufacturing, the material efficiency and how much material we use is still doesn't doesn't mean is it zero carbon still we can use them freely. The same thing with the timber element that we mentioned earlier. So we need still need to make it really more energy and the material efficient before we can say oh, this is actually also zero carbon, low carbon materials in the supply chain. One of the interesting things with the supply chain, I was at the BCO conference last week and they were talking about um, some experiments being done using graphene in concrete so you don't need reinforcement. There seems to be a will from the supply chain for innovation. So we've obviously seen SEM3 concrete, we're seeing um, uh, reinforcement not needed in concrete. One of the barriers to potentially that is uh, design codes. So one of the main reasons why sand free concrete isn't being used extensively in structures is because it's not in the structural design codes. Sarah, as a structural engineer, what do you think I Street or do you think I Street and others are doing enough to update their design standards? Uh, and could they be doing more? I, th I think the I Street are actually doing a, a really good job. Um, I think in terms of educating structural engineers and bringing the, um, you know, the structural carbon contribution um, into the conversation, I think they're doing an excellent job of that. And in terms of their influence over um, both European and, um, you know, national design standards, I think that's something that they're aware of and, and pushing for. And um, I think the likes of Will Arnold and, and um, his research group, I think they're really pushing for that. So I don't know the full detail of it, but I think just if you want to take um, the I struct as an example um, and bear in mind that many institutions are doing similar, that there's increased guidance coming out and increased um, information being made available to engineers and designers to have a, a greater awareness and and it's very practical as well um i think only to add on that of what's already been said in, in terms of how you reduce the carbon of your design would yes we've been talking about specification but at the end of the day it, it's using less um and i think i just my own thoughts to add to this really is when we're looking at carbon intensity we're taking the tons of carbon and we're dividing that by the um the gross internal floor area so then as as chan sh showed on that slide you can have uh, a small building with um less tons of carbon um however it has a high carbon intensity and and when you compare that to a benchmark you think oh well this small building is doing really badly but I think it's it's probably prudent to mention that um, at the end of the day, you're 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 still putting in more tons of carbon when you create a, a bigger development and when you're creating a new development. And just because your carbon intensity looks low or good compared to the benchmark doesn't mean it's it's actually being any more beneficial to the environment. Um, and when we're talking about net zero carbon definitions and actually um, what makes a net zero carbon development you're having to offset your tons of carbon. You're not offsetting your intensity of carbon. Um, so that's my understanding of it. So the more tons of carbon you're putting out there, the more you're going to have to pay to offset or, or pay in other terms. So um, just thought I would add that. But if you want more information about the iStruct T, then definitely reach out to Will Arnold and um, look on their website. Thank you. And in terms of that, that leads on to another very good discussion and question. Is intensity per square meter the right metric? Should we be looking at intensity per uh, occupant or should we be looking at absolute 
uh, carbon emissions or, or all three. Simon, what's 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 going into the new RICS guidance? Um, <clears throat> I think that, that there's an interesting uh, issue here because, of course, ultimately what the ap what the atmosphere is concerned about is tons of carbon. But of course, um, what we need to do is reconcile that with <clears throat> the fact that we are, you know, globally a growing economy and so on, um, and growing population. So we have to bring down the rate, the square meter rate that was being talked about, the square meter rate, bring it down at a faster rate than the increase in development, if you like, uh, and compatible with what Chen was saying. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of double problem. Um, but of course, we we have to do both, and if, and, and I think the. Um, the, uh, for example, things like science-based targets try and put in context what an individual company m should be doing in relation to the whole. But um, it, it is it is difficult. It is a dilemma. But I think you know there are. Uh, I think if we look at it again, if we as the awareness increases across, um, and what I'm noticing with the, with some of the sort of more aware developers is that they are um, recognizing that. Um, companies, their employees are coming in, the next generation of employees is coming in uh, and they have different concerns. They're more climate aware typically and so on. And therefore the pressure to reduce is going to become more intense. And in the same way that people are you know, moving rapidly to electric cars, I think that level of awareness will start to impact on buildings. And so you know, the, um, the rate of decrease, I think will start to become a kind of competitive uh, issue. <laughs> Um, and the, the square meter rate of your building will become something that you know you're, you you compare from the point of it's already starting to happen. I mean, you look at sort of British land or land sex websites, you you already see target figures which are, are, are more or less compatible with um, the Letty targets and the G and indeed the GLA targets or, or benchmarks. One of the one of the most interesting or hottest topics in the industry at the moment is obviously around the retrofit and reuse debate. So we've obviously seen a number of planning authorities uh, really push for retrofit and, and reuse. Um, I, and and now, which is great, schemes are having to look at the option of new build versus retrofit. But what there isn't at the moment is guidance on what that retrofit baseline would have to look like. So it's possible when you do look in a scheme to um, to have as your baseline a highly energy intensive retrofit, taking off the facade, adding floors on compared to, say, a fully CLT or hybrid timber solution. So. In those instances, the retrofit could have a higher upfront and whole life carbon assessment than the new building. Is there any guidance on what defines the baseline for retrofit? And is there any guidance to look at what, how you should be reviewing a existing building, whether it's fit for purpose to be reused? Because we, we want to retrofit as much as possible, but there are some buildings in some instances which probably shouldn't be retrofitted. And I don't think there's any decent guidance out there. Is that coming? Um, I think that's an interesting, uh, interesting, good question. I think to some extent, some of that will be addressed in um, the upgrade of EN15978, which is the standard, which kind of governs the modular structure for doing assessments, but not to the extent you're asking. Um, I think though that, um, the, the use of the word retrofit rather than refurbishment is important because I think retrofit implies um, environmental enhancements. And you could say that it implies environmental enhancements to an existing building up to current standards. So if that's what's proposed by a retrofit, then um, clearly that's an important uh, a, a, a benchmark. So you know, if you're bringing it up to modern environmental standards. Now, if that is not achievable because the building is beyond... I think it's called a stranded asset, but it's beyond kind of uh, repair, if you like. Well, then clearly <clears throat> other ideas have to be brought into, uh, into, into, into play, whether it's demolished or whether it's, you know, reused in a different purpose or something is, is, is open to, to question. But obviously there are examples of this um, going on right now. And, and certainly I think the sort of whole Marks and Spencer debate will be, uh, and that's just being called in by Michael Gove, um, but that will 
I think highlight some of these issues because um, it 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 is about what could you do with with buildings, and I think the the um, the cost in in carbon terms to the environment is not just about the cost of demolition. Um, it is about the lost opportunity, if you like, from demolishing something that has a potential future. Um, and if you take, for example, the Marcus Spencer site, you know, the oldest building on the corner, the one that we're familiar with, is 90 years old. But the two adjacent buildings are all part of the same site. One of them is 36 years old, one's 52 years old, which you would have thought should be capable of, you know, it seems crazy to be demolishing buildings of that age um, without at least working on how they could be properly uh, uh, retrofitted. And I think with, that, sorry. With, 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 with regards to the Marks and Spencers, I don't want to uh, save away which way it should be done, but uh, obviously being drawn in by Michael Gove, it, the question is who's actually reviewing that? Because if it's being done just for, from a political viewpoint uh, or whether it's being done from a technical viewpoint. So uh, yeah, again, it comes, back, it comes back to who, who should be reviewing and, and is there guidance for reviewing uh, fit for purpose? And I think that's one of the biggest things because a lot of developers are very nervous about doing uh, knockdown rebuild and some of them are fully justified. Some of them aren't justified, but there's no, who, who's to say whether it's justified and, and is there a guidance out there where they could get that justification? I think that's probably one of the, the biggest challenges we see going forward. I think uh, that's a fair point. I think just in the MS case, I think that will be a public inquiry. So you know, arguments will be made from all sides. But I think as a more general point, um, and there are plenty of schemes like this, you know, coming forward across London. Um, in particular, I mean, there's London Wall West, there's uh, uh, buildings in, in Camden and, and, and other buildings in Westminster where this exact problem is, is, is coming forward. And I, I, I think we need to... You know, if the government has this trajectory to net zero, um, we can't get there with by doing the things that we've been doing before. We have to do things differently. Uh, but in terms of guidance, which I think is really the point you're making, Simon, is that I think um, I'm not aware of any specific guidance apart from just the principle of reducing as fast and as far as possible. Yeah, and I think I agree with uh, both Simons and in terms of the 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 date, there's no guidance so far. And what we've seen is the there are more precise um, requirements from GLA. It's actually, in some, some cases we're working on, we've been asked to produce a, a more detailed assessment than it is done for an energy officer and the planning officer to check the validity. But there, there's no guidance they can refer to. They just have a basically that to make, make sense for, for them. But again, the, the, I think there probably there, there's a gap. There's probably calling for some guidance to be produced by either any organization, either or planning department or or a, a, a maybe RCS can produce another set of verification or, or checklist to verify or define what is a feasible scheme or what is not a feasible or, or scheme to be demolished or be. It's I think yeah, there's a definite lack of, of guidance at the moment and in, in the market from, from, from where we can see. Thank you. I think we're coming towards the end of the session, but one of the interesting things I'd like to leave you with is uh, we've obviously been talking about the challenge of getting down to these intensity targets and uh, and, and talking about the benefits of retrofit and, and what, what we need to do but retrofit is definitely uh, one of the key solutions for this because I, I saw a study recently that showed that if we carry on with the rate of development that we're planning to do uh, even if uh, all the developments are hitting the LETI intensity targets for both operation energy and embodied carbon Paris proof we'll have all net zero carbon buildings but we'll be living in a 2.5 degree world so uh, uh, we need to reduce what we're actually doing as well as hitting the targets the targets are only a step on the way they're not the final solution Solution. So we, we, there's still significant work to be done, just getting to those targets, but those targets alone won't be enough. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you to my excellent panel uh, and hopefully speak to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.